Good morning, everyone. Today's class, World Religions class, is on Hinduism. This is our fourth talk in the Series 3, Moralistic, Mythical, and Mysticism Religions. And next week, Neil will discuss Buddhism. I reference, I use uh, the World Religions and Cults Volume 2 for mm -hmm. some of the information. So the outline today's talk introduce Hinduism with a focus on India. Talk about what's the Hindu concept of God. Hint, they believe in more than one God. Hindu concept of creation. Hindu concept of man and sin. And then Hindu concept of salvation. That's where yoga comes in. You'll see how it's connected. Yoga is almost a form of their salvation. And then how do we dialogue with Hindus? Okay. Hinduism. It's a very old religion and starts shortly after the Tower of Babel. And it was present at the time of Abraham. It was founded in modern day India when the people who group who left the Tower of Babel settled in modern day India. It's considered the third largest world religion. Anybody know what's number one? Actually, Christianity. Two point yeah, I know. <laughs> 2.3 billion, 31% of the world claims to be a Christian. What's number two? Islam. 1.8 billion, or one-fourth of the world claims to be an Islam. And Hinduism is number three, with 1.2 billion, which is 15% of the world. Now, Christians are the largest religious group. This is off the Pew Research Center poll. And it says 2.3 billion. Neil brought the unaffiliated, and that's even higher than Hindus. So, and that's 16% of the world. So there's a lot of unaffiliated folks who outnumber the Hindus. Buddhism, or Buddhists, are right under Hindus. So they're quite numerous as well. India. Let's talk about India because that's where most of the Hindus live. The population is 1.31 billion people. China is 1.37. But due to the population increase in India and the Chinese holding down the population increase, by 2022, two years, India will surpass China's population. 80% or 8 out of 10 people in India are Hindus. So if you met someone from India, there's an 80% chance they were a Hindu or are a Hindu. 15% in India are Muslims, so that's the second most. And then you got the 5% others, 2.3, almost half are Christians. The rest are Sikhs, Buddhists, and those who practice Jainism. Hinduism has been imported into our country. It's the fastest religious group being imported into the U.S. In 2000, we had 1.6 million Hindus living in the U.S. By 2013, that more than doubled to 3.4 million Hindus. The last poll, 2017, 4 million Hindus. But note, we have an additional over 1 million Americans who converted to Hinduism. So we have probably over 5 million people who believe in Hinduism. Some Indian immigration. Now, with India, you probably notice that they have a high level of education. There's more PhDs in India than any other world country. 48% of the Asian Indians that live in America have a PhD. That's almost half, it's pretty impressive. So if you have a PhD, advanced degree, of course you're gonna have higher income. So 51% of the Indians who migrated here have household incomes greater than $100,000. 70% have household incomes greater than 75,000. So, a couple quick tips before we hit at the end. Indian evangelism, many tend to travel back home to visit family and friends. So one Indian Christian can have a multiplying effect when they travel home or share their faith via phones or social media. Hinduism is actually walking into our culture. I brought this up with the New Age movement. 24% of Americans believe in reincarnation. That's almost one in four. You know, where does that come from? Yoga, and I'm going to hit this pretty hard today. Yoga is a form of Hinduism, and it's a form of their salvation. Many Christians view yoga as harmless. Hinduism, let's get into, 
it's the same as uh, the New Age movement. Polytheism, you break the word up into poly and theism. Poly is the Greek word, which means many. And theism is belief in the existence of God or God. So polytheism is many gods. Quick question. Does anybody know how many gods are in Hinduism? Oh, wait. I heard a million. R higher. There's a general idea. Joshua. Yes, but they also have many gods. Any other numbers people want to throw out? I, I got a million. 300. You nailed it. 300 million. <laughs> That's a lot of gods. <laughs> okay. Also, it holds to pantheism. You break up pantheism into pan and theism. Pan is a Greek word for all. So they believe all is God and God is all. We talked about that in the New Age movement. You are a god. I'm a god. In, in India, some people even can worship a tree because they could believe the tree is a god. So they make the tree in front of their home as a god. And there's been witnesses for people who go to India. There might be a, a poor Hindu who's lacking food. You know, he might see his ribs coming out. He would pour his family's precious milk at the base of this tree to worship this tree god. Because that's more important than feeding my family right away. And then the third is monism, where all is one. The entire universe is one. Doesn't stink, And they don't distinguish between right and wrong. Now, we'll get into karma. This denies our dualistic view of the physical, where we're at here and now, and the spiritual reality. Because Hinduism focuses more on the spiritual and not the physical. I brought this quote up last time, but it kind of you know, reinforces the... The thought of Hinduism, God is the sum total of all that exists. Every manifested phenomena is part of God. And the space between these manifested phenomena is God. So in a very real sense, there isn't anything else. You are God. I am God. This microphone is God. This table is God. This laptop is God. All is God. So that gets into the Hindu concept of God. What is their, you can call revelation or authority. They don't really have a God-given revelation. But they do have what's called the Vedas. And the Vedas were written between 1600 B.C. and 1200 B.C., right after the flood, um, right about Abraham's time. And this Rig Veda, there's a picture up here, is some of their oldest writings. And they talk about the yogas or the yogis from the beginning. The Vedas are the most reverent, the Hindu writings. They were supposedly heard from the ultimate god, Brahman, but nobody knows who wrote them. Then there's another set of writings, the Upanishads. They came later. They were written between 800 and 200 BC, and they contain some of the Hindu myths. They have a creation myth. They have a worldwide flood myth, and they have the Tower of Babel myth. They also have a discussion of someone getting swallowed by a fish and spit back on the land. The third is the the H is silent, Bhagavad Gita, if I pronounce that right. And um, the Gitas are commentaries on the Vedas and the Upanishads, and they tell Hindus how to apply and live out the other two sets of books. Anybody heard of the Mahatma Gandhi? Okay, a couple. He read the Gitas and called them his spiritual dictionary. If you go to India, sometimes in the hotels, they'll place a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, excuse me, in the dresser drawers instead of the Bibles. And there's long traditions that go back 3,400 years. In Hindu writing, you'll hear and read echoes of the biblical creation account. You'll hear about the global flood account and the Tower of Babel with different languages. Now, wouldn't this make perfect sense? Since the Hindu group were a subset of those who gathered at the Tower of Babel and then were dispersed and they settled in modern day India and they took those stories with them. But those stories became perverted a little bit over time. You know, some places won't call it Mount Ararat, but they may reference the big mountain in their area and they won't maybe use Noah, but they'll use their ancestor who was famous. 
So some of the Hindus' major gods. The top one is Brahman. I'm spell, spelling this out because there's slight differentiations as we get the, to the lower gods. Brahman is the supreme god of the universe. Um, remember, they have hundreds of millions of gods. I'm going to focus on something like a top ten. Brahman is he's transcendent and eternal. He's so transcendent, we cannot interact with him in any way. So they don't have an interpersonal God. Everything in the universe, though, is an emanation of Brahman, okay? He is impersonal, but can manifest himself in personal ways and in different deities. So it does not make sense to us when we try to reason with Hindus because we believe in a personal God, and they believe in an impersonal Brahman or their supreme God. So in the Vedas, we have Brahman and a female unnamed power produce their son called Brahma, no end, okay? There's a picture of Brahma, Brahman's son. He has four heads, there's a head in the back, and it signifies all seeing, all knowing, all hearing, and he witnesses everything. And nothing occurs in the universe that he is not aware of. So that's Brahma. The next god is Saraswati, and that is Brahman's sister that he married. Okay, This is a kind of a corruption of Abraham and Sarah, because Abraham married his half-sister Sarah. And Brahman's son is Daksha, and it's a very variation of the name Jokshan. And we read that in Genesis 25, 1 through 3, when Abraham took another wife whose name was Katara, and she bore to him Zimron Jokshan. What does this all mean? You know, why am I bringing this up? Well, in early, early Hinduism, actually came out of Vedism, was essentially a form of ancestor worship. You know, back before the flood, a lot of the people lived to be 900 years old, and that's a long time. So, do you realize that ancestor worship happened all over the world? It happened in Hindu, where they worship their ancestors. You see it in Shinto in Japan. You see it in the Greek mythology. Um, you see it in the Egyptian mythology. You see it in the Norse and, and Germanic mythologies and Roman mythology. Okay, we talked about Brahman, Brahma. The third one is Brahmin. Brahmin, through the process of reincarnation, they have reached the highest level in Indian Hindu that they can reach. They're greatly respected. They are highly esteemed. These are like the version, say, of our pastor or priest in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, if you ever go to an airport and see one of these Hindu Brahmins, people throw flowers in front of them and they kiss the ground before and behind them. A good Brahmin, when they die, they don't get reincarnated again. Uh, they become one of the supreme beings. So other gods, there is Vishnu, the male version. It's another Hindu god, is the incarnation of the one supreme god. And notice he has several arms. There's an arm, he has four arms. Two arms on the left, two arms on the right, and there he's holding. Looks like a, a pie. But there's a male Vishnu and a female Vishnu. You can tell it because the male Vishnu is colored blue. Notice what he's sitting on. He's up in the clouds, and what's this look like? Serpents or snakes, like four big snakes combined into one. That doesn't look nice, does it? Makes you think of, of the devil. This is a female Vishnu, and she is colored more white-like. In fact, Dr. Carl uh, Brogy went to India and he saw a Vishnu temple, and you can see the female Vishnu in the back. And he actually uses an opportunity to witness. And I have a short clip of his audio where he talks about this picture he took. One occasion when I was in India, this was a temple that Vishnu had off the sidewalk. And so right out there in the open, and I said to my fellow that was with me, I said, let's go in there and share the gospel. He says, in there? I said, sure, why not? I said, they're lost. They need to hear the gospel. And so we went in there. And uh, the guy with no shirt on and the orange uh, towel around his neck, he was the head priest. And he had about 10 people there that day. And 
uh, he, um, he was really lost and not open at all. And by the time I was done, he was mad at me. But with that said, I shared the gospel with him. And that man that has his hand up, he asked me if I would pray for him. He said he was trying to sort out what truth was. I said, well, Jesus is truth. The Bible is true. And I said, there's two big questions everyone has to ask in life. Is Jesus Christ the creator God of the universe who made you and everything that you see? And is the Bible true? And if it is, then you will have found truth. He said, help me, pray for me. And so I prayed for him. And I don't know, he was looking at me with his eyes open and put his hand up too. And uh, there are people who are open in this country. There you go. And there's another picture he showed I didn't bring up where he had hundreds and hundreds of people coming to hear him preach. And they said they became born again that day. So the Hindu people are open to the truth. Here's another famous Hindu god called Shiva. Shiva is represented here as a male. Sometimes she's a female. We'll talk about her a little bit later. And here's Krishna. You heard the term Hari Krishna. It's a major Hindu god and considered the eighth incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, Krishna is perhaps the most popular of all the heroes of Hindu mythology. Krishna's adventures are recounted in the Bhagavad Gita in the sacred collection of texts known as the Puranas, where Krishna is described as, as a supreme being. Here's a picture of one, a, a Hari Krishna, you might see at the airport. They'll typically be in orange jumpsuits, as you see here. And they recite this mantra, Hari Krishna, over and over again. When you meet these people at airports, most of them speak English, because most of the Indian population speaks English. So you can actually talk to them and witness to them. Okay, I have a Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. This audio track was produced. Does anybody know who George Harrison is? Beatles. He was the Beatles lead guitarist. And he actually created this song back in 1969 featuring the London Radha Krishna Temple. This song was an international hit and reached the number 12 position in the UK singles chart in 1969. It also helped popularize the Hare Krishna mantra in the West. And it's a repetitive mantra. I'll play it. It goes Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Ramna, Hare Hare. It'll go a couple minutes and they speed up the pace. But this was an actual single hit in 1969. And you might have heard this. Anybody ever heard that? More of the Hindu gods. Um, a very popular Hindu god in India is called the Maratu Maratu, or the monkey god. In India, monkeys are like our squirrels here. They're everywhere. They're swinging from trees. So if all is God and God is all, why not make a god of something that you like? You know, maybe if we were Hindu, we'd make the squirrel god. But they make a monkey god. If you like monkeys, then make a monkey god. They actually write superhero stories 
for their false god, and the kids read about Maratu. Athletes and wrestlers actually worship Maratu because the monkey's considered strong. The next god is Ganesh. Anybody hear of Ganesh? Okay. Ganesh is the elephant god. What two places in the world have the most elephants? There you go, India and Africa. So the, there's many elephants in India, and they're the largest animals in the country. And elephants are viewed as strong, and they're the biggest animal on land. They also view them with positive qualities. This god is considered loving and forgiving deity. His head symbolizes wisdom, and his large ears enable him to hear everything and sort out the good from the evil. His fat belly, and I'm sure Neil will talk about this in Buddhism, his fat belly is considered the source of all wisdom in the world, similar to the Buddha. And a fat belly is the picture of where wisdom sits. Wouldn't that be nice if that was popular in our culture? If you're fat, you're looked at as wise. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know if you know this, but George Lucas, who came up with Star Wars, was a committed Hindu. He incorporated Hindu themes throughout the Star Wars movies. In fact, in his autobiography, Star Wars was a reason to propagate pantheism in a Hindu worldview. Some key points. The force. Force is a concept of all-pervading all and all-binding force. It's probably the most central theme of all the Star Wars saga. The plot line of the entire series is based on how the force is used by the righteous Jedis on one side, and then you have the unrighteous Sis on the other. In the original trilogy, the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi describes the force as an energy field created by all living things. See how that ties in? By all living things, it surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. So that definition is no different from the Hindu definition of what's called Shakti or Maya. Uh, it's considered as the source of the universe which pervades everything. In the Hindu philosophy, remember Brahman, the supreme god of the universe. I'm sorry, Sh Shakti. I'm pr pronouncing it wrong. S-H-A-K-T-I. Shakti is the concept and personification of the divine feminine creative power, sometimes referred to as the gr great divine mother. Shakti embodies the active feminine energy of Shiva. Thus, every object in the universe, living or non-living, has a spark of Shiva or a consciousness and a spark of Shakti or energy. So Shakti surrounds us, penetrates us, upholds the galaxies. Panishad definition of God is creator, sustainer, and destroyer. Thus, the force of Star Wars clearly corresponds to the ancient Hindu concept of all-pervading Shakti, which literally means power, force, and energy. I won't get into the details of these other ones, but there's other terms that have Hindu, light and dark side of the force, Jedi's, Jedi teacher discipline training, and the superhuman abilities of Jedi and yogic powers. You know, skip some of this. But if you're interested in some of these connections, we can talk later. The Hindu creation concept of creation. They have a trinity. They call it a trimorti. And their trinity is consists of Brahma, the four-headed god, the son of Brahman. And Brahma is the creator of the universe. Vishnu is the sustainer of the universe. And Shiva is the destroyer of the universe. So Shiva will destroy the universe after so long. So you have creation, making creation, making creation into higher forms. So you have the, they believe in reincarnations and different creations uh, in the future. So the Hindu creation view, all is one and, and one is all concept. So this would affect how you treat the creation, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, let's see. If a cow is God and a monkey is a God, and if a rat is a God, then you would treat them differently. The reason I have this picture up here, in the 1980s when food was sent to India, the biggest frustration of world vision was that all the food that they sent to places like Calcutta was being eaten by the rats. The locals 
would not get rid of the rats because the rat could be my third cousin who had bad karma reincarnated. Therefore, we need to take care of those rats because that could be my brother rat. So that's the Calcutta rat example. We have another one, the New Delhi cow example. So the cow is viewed as a life sustainer. She gives milk. Uh, she gives life through milk. So they worship the cow. Uh, in that uh, video I showed you, Dr. Brogy saw a man in New Delhi with his rib showing. And he was trying to, he had a vegetable stand like you might see in the back there. And, you know, that was a way for him to take care of the needs of his family, selling vegetables and bringing it home. A cow came walking down the street, goes up to his vegetable stand, and starts eating the vegetables. Was he mad? Not at all. In fact, he went down and started worshiping the cow. Why? Because the goddess cow came to visit his vegetable stand, and that was an honor. 30% of Hindus are vegetarian, so if you if you have someone over for dinner, uh, be careful what you serve them. Now, the, in India, they eat a lot of chicken and goat, goat, but they don't like pork. So, you know, you might not want to offer pork if you have one over at your house. Now, Romans 1, 18 through 20. Why do the Hindus act and worship this way? I want to read Romans 1. You're all familiar with this says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the righteousness of men who suppresses the truth through unrighteousness. We have that in Hindus. We have that in our culture today with evolution where the scientists suppress the truth through unrighteousness. For what may be known about God is clear to them since God has shown it to them. The invisible things about him, his eternal power, deity, have been clearly seen through the creation of the world and are understood by the things that are made. So they are without excuse. 21 through 23, because they knew God, they did not glorify him or give thanks to him as God, but became futile in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like we saw in those gods made like corruptible man, birds, four footed beasts, four headed people and creeping things. So how, how do the people get here? They suppress the truth and unrighteousness and exchange what they know through the creation for a lie. Therefore, they believe what is false. Hindu concept of man. In Hinduism, man is another emanation of Brahman, their supreme being. And his soul, there's another word called Atman, A-T-M-A-N. It's on the screen. They are bound to the laws of karma and samsara, or rebirth. Samsara is the reincarnation cycle. Or rebirth. The picture on the bottom shows how the reincarnations happen through time, and they're bound to karma. If you do good deeds, it'll come back to you as being positive in the next life. In fact, we had we, we were trying to do a service with someone from India, and they said, hey, "Good day and good karma." Okay, this bullet here: physical reality to them is false, or what they call the Maya. This ties into monism. It, there's no truth in our physical expressions. Everything is true is bound up in their souls. They believe we need to escape the physical reality and transcend into the physical and the spiritual. You probably heard the term transcendental meditation. You need to get your Atman to transcend your Maya to overcome the illusions of this physical reality. That's where we get into a little bit of yoga. Hindus try to escape the physical reality to transcend into the higher plane of the spiritual reality. Reincarnated based on karma and dharma. So after you die, you follow the cycle of samsara. You'll be reincarnated based on your karma and your dharma. So if you live a good life or have good karma in this life, you'll come back in a better state in the next reincarnation cycle. So this leads up to what's called the caste system. Anybody heard of the caste system? Yeah. Okay. The caste system was developed in the Indian culture. Here is the caste system. It's technically illegal in India, but it's practiced everywhere, everywhere, and it's part of their culture and life. But at the bottom are the what's called the untouchables, or the outcasts. They are the street sweepers, latrine cleaners. They're considered outcasts, and they arrived at this level due to bad karma. They deserve to be there. That's their mindset. For those in the untouchable lowest level, you cannot interfere with their state or help them. Pastor Brogy. He went up to one of these uh, cleaners in the Indian uh, airport, 
And, you know, he gave him the gospel and gave him some cash. And the, the people there looked at him like, you know, you shouldn't be giving him any favors because he deserves to be here. So for those who are in a touchable lowest level, you can't interfere with their state or help them because you're interfering with their karma and they deserve to be there in their mindset. So can Hindus have compassion on these people? Absolutely not. They believe, you know, hopefully they'll die, they'll break the caste system, and then they'll move up to the higher level when they're reincarnated. So there's no compassion there. Of course, at the top is what we saw, the Brahmin priest. That's the highest level. And when he dies, he will become one with God. And then there's major divisions. You have the warriors and kings, the merchants and landowners, and the commoners, peasants, and servants. Another thing I want to bring up, yoga plays an important role. Yoga helps develop good karma. If you speak to yoga teachers in America, and if they're honest with you, they will tell you the number one tool to recruit Americans into Hinduism is through yoga. Yoga is a religious practice, and I'll show you a lot of examples. It's, it's not exercise. It's a religious practice. Okay, here's another way to get rid of their karma. They can go to the Ganges River to bathe and wash away the negative karma to move up into the reincarnation cycle. So it's really a religion with no hope and based on human effort. So being good cannot, as we know, being good can't earn your way to heaven. It can't remove the sins that you committed. We can't go to the uh, Ganges River and wash our sins away because we'll be held accountable to the sins of the past. And, and we have the sin nature that we inherited. So they have a, a works type of mentality. And the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. So that's the caste system. What's the Hindu concept of sin? Well, they have a vague concept of bad or good deeds, but they follow, follow this law of karma. And to reiterate, karma is a Hindu word for action or deed. So good karma would be good actions and good deeds. And if you do enough good action and deeds when you die, you'll, you'll be reincarnated to a higher level in that caste system. Here's a picture I want to show you. Notice the tree is on top of the beaver. The law of karma says if you harm other beings, like the, the beaver harmed the tree by cutting it down, then bad karma will come back to you. And when he cut down the tree, it fell on him. So that's bad karma. So the beaver was doing bad things by cutting down the tree, and the bad karma killed him. Okay. Also, there's right acts defined as dharma or sacred duty. Dharma is a code of ethics or right ways to act, but it's not well defined. And it's not detailed like the Bible. Anybody heard the expression, holy cow? Okay. Where, where do you think that expression comes from? One sect of Hinduism, like I said, views the cow as sacred or holy. Other sects view the monkey as sacred. So if you kill a monkey, then it's worse than killing a person. That's why the cow eating that guy's vegetables, he didn't care. He felt it was an honor. And this leads to dietary laws. And like I mentioned, Hindus are vegetarian. Hindu concept of salvation. This is where we get into yoga. How do Hindus break the law of samsara or rebirths? Well, they achieve moksha. That's their term for salvation. To achieve moksha, you need to be separated from the physical reality. You need to become one with Brahman. The ultimate goal is to become one with Brahman and destroy your physical identity. The true physical existence we have right now no longer matters to them. And you're becoming one with the universal reality. The goal, actually, ultimately, is extinction. And that is the target for salvation in Hinduism. To do this, they follow different paths that are called yogas. And yoga leads, yogas lead to moksha. There is a four-part yoga plan on the screen. They also have eight parts and five parts. This four-part, I'll read a couple. One is Raja Yoga, and that's right here. It's known as... The, it's where you disconnect your mind with a physical reality and be connected with the spiritual idea of Brahman. So when you're doing your yoga exercise and you're clearing your mind, this is what you're trying to do. Detach from the physical reality and be connected with the spiritual idea of Brahman. Also, there's physical forms of yoga known as Hatha Yoga or Kundalina Yoga. These are different physical postures of things. And I'll talk about the postures because... Every yoga posture, like the guys in right there in the picture, imitates some aspect of nature. This is intended to cause the energies in your body to flow in different ways so you can balance your energies, elevate your chi so your third eye gets enlightened so you can achieve enlightenment. 
So yoga poses imitates aspects of nature, especially sun and moon salutations. And I'll, I'll show you a video where the guy talks about it. These poses are actually honoring the sun god and the moon god. And people don't know that. Every pose is designed to channel energies. You have a different situation. You have different stations in your body. So the lowest one stays in your spine. As you meditate, they move the energies up through six different levels. If you can achieve total disconnect from the world, you've achieved enlightenment and your third eye becomes enlightened. Yoga exercises are part of Hindu salvation rituals. If you want to be aware of what all those different postures and poses are doing, Eastern meditation is to disconnect from reality. Biblical meditation is to internalize God's word and think on truth, not empty your mind. You're supposed to think on God's truth to grow spiritually. So that's their salvation. I'm going to play a video here. I got off the uh, internet. It's uh, a yoga video clip called Ganesha's Play Demonstration. A woman named Sandra Carson will use yoga to worship Ganesha. She'll actually have the idol behind her candle. She is showing how you can worship Ganesha, that's the elephant god, through emptying your mind, and she'll talk about that, and have different poses, and she'll speak this Ganesha mantra, which is a repetitive chant. And Ganesha is a chubby, happy elephant, the symbol of qualities that we turn to to overcome our problems and open up to a new dimension of ourselves. I'll, this goes, I think, three minutes, but I cut down most of it. Let's see. Hello and welcome to Eckhart Yoga. My name is Sandra. In this series on the deities, we'll focus on Ganesha today in this class. And Ganesha is the elephant god. There is a statue right behind me with Ganesha. And Ganesha knows many different meanings and there's many different symbols that he represents. And today we're going to practice in the form of Ganesha as the remover of obstacles. And at the same time that he removes the obstacles, he places them in front of us as well. Because unless we're faced with our problems and faced with our issues, we don't really have an opportunity to solve them and to overcome them. So today we're going to practice hip openers and deeper twists, and we'll practice with the quality of softness for when we encounter our obstacles with softness, we can dissolve them. So please take a comfortable seat. You can have a block handy for this class if you need to. And take your hands to your thighs and take your shoulder blades on your back and then close your eyes. Take a nice deep breath in, turn to your breath. Our yoga practice is like a microcosmic reflection of our life. And it is often in our yoga practice that we encounter different aspects of ourselves, qualities, and also our weaknesses and the things that frustrate us. Because then we become aware, and we can start to dissolve tendencies and habits and ways that we react. We're going to open this class with a Ganesha mantra. We're going to do this mantra nine times, and you're welcome to join in, or silently repeat, or just listen. Please fold your hands, Anjali Mudra. Om Ganga Pataye Namaha, Om Ganga Pataye Namaha, Om Ganga Pataye Namaha. Om. Seven more times. What do we read in the Bible about vain repetitions? Matthew 6, 7 talks about that. For when, they, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. For they think they will be heard for their much speaking. I have another video. Um, here's a YouTube video clip that connects yoga poses with the sun salutation and the moon salutation and reinforces the yoga and Hinduism connection. Now, those that are doing yoga for Christians and Christian yoga really don't understand that they are practicing Hinduism. 
Nothing about yoga is innocent. Even the yoga positions are specifically made to worship other gods. The yoga postures are offering to the gods. It's believed that if you do these postures and do the breathing techniques along with the meditation, then you will be accepted by a god. There are many different gods in Hinduism. And to note that all postures and poses are all in reference to a false deity. They all have meanings in reference to occultism. They are all rooted in the culture of Satan. They have sun salutations and moon salutations. If you understand anything about paganism, you will know that in the ancient days, the pagans worshipped the sun and the moon. There was the sun god and moon goddess. The sun salutation pays homage and worship to the sun, even if the one doing the pose is unaware of it. All of these poses are sun salutations. Again, people who are doing these poses are saluting the sun, something a Christian should never do. These poses are moon salutations. When performing these poses, they are saluting the moon. Please remember that the sun god and moon goddess are all representations of Lucifer. When you are doing these poses, you are paying homage to Lucifer. So there obviously is no Christian way of doing yoga. Now, not only should we understand that it's wrong to do poses with our body that salute Satan, but we should also understand the dangers of spirituality. It should be known that in this highly spiritually wicked world, when we do things that have roots in the occult, we give demons and spirits access points and open doorways for them to enter in. When we engage in occult practices, we allow demons and spirits to enter into doorways that we should not have opened. For a Christian, you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to be blocked in your life and are allowing the power of demons and spirits to be manifested. We are his people and we should not defile our temple with the things that are not made for him. Yoga is not a harmless activity. We just need to know the truth about these traditions and practices we were encouraged to blindly accept. If you are a Christian and you have engaged in yoga, please stop and pray about it. Remember, there is no yoga without Hinduism and no Hinduism without yoga is that the devil's ways have been marketed and promoted to us as harmless and beneficial, so much so that we do not see the devil in it. Think about it. There are poses that are literally made to salute the sun. Why would the father want us engaging in activities that are created to salute the sun? He has never told us to do things like this. One of the biggest mistakes people make is just writing things off as harmless and inconsequential, believing that things aren't that big of a deal, and just as long as they believe in Yahshua, they can do what they want and be saved. This is a lie from the pit of hell. Yoga is a form of practicing Hinduism. Remember that Sri K. Patabi Joyce said that the spiritual aspect, which is beyond the physical, is the purpose of yoga. All the devil did is find a way to promote his form of spiritual activity and disguise it as harmless exercise. There is no Christian yoga. Those positions you are doing are used to worship Satan. Just place this in the same box that all the other pieces of deception of this world are placed in. It's just something else that you now know better. Okay. I have another clip interview with an actual Swami and, uh, he asks, he answers the question, can Christians do yoga if they put Christ in their mind and do the exercise? It's interesting what he has to say. But in doing, so they don't say hatha. Worshipful postures is what they are. Mm -hmm. Raja yoga, meditation, and jnana yoga, or enlightenment. All right, but how's about this, Swami Param? How's about... If I am doing my hatha yoga to not be connected, to not connect my Atman to the Brahman, but to connect my spirit to Jesus Christ? It uh, wouldn't work. Why not? Well, because uh, Christianity and Hinduism are totally different religions. But in my mind... There is no Jesus Christ. There's no Jesus Christ in Hinduism or yoga. But I'm, in my mind, I'm using it to connect, be closer to my deity, well, a lot of people do that, but uh, in my opinion, that's a very shallow individual. That's a shallow Christian. Because? Because they should be adhering to their own Christian principles. It's wonderful to learn and study about different religions, and we should do that and respect them. But we cross the line when we start to mix these up. Could I, but can I not learn from a different religious worldview and apply it? I, I, I'm not thinking Brahman. I'm thinking Jesus. Therefore... It's okay. Okay, then pray to Jesus. Do <laughs> Hail Marys or whatever. But if you're doing yoga, you're doing Hinduism. <laughs> when you're doing yoga, you're doing Hinduism. Here's another clip I'm going to show. Maybe I won't play it all the way through. Is it wrong for a Christian to do yoga? This was on CNN Headline Prime. This was uh, like 
nine years ago or so. And John MacArthur is interviewed, and he gives an interesting answer. There's also another pastor who's actually teaching yoga at his church. So the, the dichotomy's there. Some Christians, one in particular, says a Christian should not do yoga. He's Pastor John MacArthur. He is pastor of Grace Community Church, uh, also host of the radio show Grace to You. He joins us now. Uh, also joining us, a pastor who completely disagrees. It says, hey, doing yoga is okay. Doug Paget, uh, his church in Minneapolis, actually offers a class in yoga. But let's start with you, John MacArthur. All right, let's say I do decide to try yoga. Head to the local gym, give it a shot. What am I opening myself up to spiritually that could go against my Christian faith? Well, that would depend on how the yoga is conducted. Uh, if it's just purely exercise and you're a strong Christian, probably wouldn't have any impact on your faith. But in the big picture, why would Christians want to borrow an expression from a false religion, uh, from pantheism? God is everything, you're God, everything is God. When we believe there's only one true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, why would we need to import that? If you want to exercise, exercise, but why borrow a term that has been part of a false religion for centuries? Doug Pange, let's get you in on this. And, and as we do, I want to read the definition from Webster's on uh, yoga. It, it says it's a Hindu theistic philosophy teaching the suppression of all activity of body, mind, and will in order that the self may realize its distinction from men and attain liberation. Kind of tough one to decipher, but on a, on a spiritual front for a Christian, right. that does not sound like Christ-centered faith to me. On the surface of that definition, what's going on here? Help us out. Well, for people who, for, who perform yoga, what they're normally trying to do is to find a whole and complete and healed life. So when people participate in yoga, most of them aren't on some kind of a yoga agenda. What they're trying to do is use whatever practices they can find that would help them have a whole and complete life. And for a Christian, that's certainly what we're after. The, the Jesus agenda is a whole life, is a complete life, is a healed life. So when people use it to relieve stress, to be healthy in their relationships, to feel good in their body, that's a really good thing. Why? In fact, there's this great little verse in the New Testament where it says, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, think upon such things. And for so many of us, yoga has been one of those whatevers that's such a positive thing in our life. Pause. Any thoughts on that interaction? He's he's saying like you have to use it to for still for healing in some way, and you can do that in a Christian way. Um, whereas John MacArthur also acknowledged that if you're just stretching, you know, you're not really doing it wrong. It's a, it's a, it is a dichotomy, but it's more interesting. Okay, Edgar. Um, so the second pastor, what he was saying is exactly the same kinds of words of the satanic petitioner that I play yoga There you go. Is. Yeah. It is straight up Satanism mm -hmm. without all the satanic panic mm -hmm. added to it like the other guy was earlier talking about the other clip. He was more of a panic. But this guy right here, he was exactly spewing forth one of the satanic statements and he claims to be a Christian pastor. Which, you know, again, Satanism is more pervasive than we would yeah. think. But yeah, that was straight up satanic what he was saying. I'll, I'll go back to you after him. Uh, can't we all just go off? <laughs> <laughs> Peter. I want to recognize that yeah, yoga does have a history of drawing people into their lives, especially, I think, in uh, prior decades. But it does kind of smell of uh, meat sacrifice to idols, just because, you know, some meat to sacrifice to idols doesn't mean that all meat is. Uh, want to eat. And, uh, and so if you are using it just as a stretching routine, separating out uh, you know, the religious content, and instead of like trying to substitute in like, some Christian um, ideology into your it doesn't really make sense. Uh, I think it's probably good for you, um, because you know, there are a lot of sources that you know, are actually helpful for your body. But, if you're if you're putting in mixing in the religious content and you know taking classes on it, that's, that's probably not a Christian. Any other? Yes. I don't think there's any position that a Christian.
tradition practicing yoga takes that is not worshiping a single deity? Mm -hmm. They have three million deities altogether. And part of yoga is saying the Om, which was, I understand, Brahm's original word and is in all of creation as one advances in yoga. And they're saying the Om. They are then becoming one with Brahm and recognizing yeah. deity. I saw Emily's hand in the back. Okay. All right. Yes. So, can I ask a question? So, I went for physical therapy for my shoulder. I'm like, I can do child's pose, which I think is a yoga position. I don't know because I've never taken a yoga class. But there needs to be a way that I can stretch out my shoulder. Yeah, so, right. You know, is that wrong because the Hindus have used it as a position of worship? I mean, people, probably the Hebrews in the temple use that as a position of worship. The, Islamic people use that as a position of worship. Does that make it something I can't do to stretch my shoulder? I mean, I don't think we all need to exercise and we all probably need to stretch. It's just when you do it in these poses it could become problematic because the tie into the salutations to the Hindu gods and all that. More seriously, when I try to do it in the you can't accept in the class the leaders not separate the theology, they, they, they push concept. They're asking right. you to think in certain ways when you do the poses. I mean, I suppose you could go in there and think God's thoughts after him as you're doing it, but it's very tough. It's like putting yourself in an environment. Pastor Joel, and then we'll go to Mark, and then I got to. Don't let people speak for themselves. I was like, had had their church website. Yeah. On their church website, they make two comments. There's no problem. Welcome. Yoga Sanctuary is a nonprofit holistic collective offering a place of respite and integration for the body, mind, and spirit. We are glad you're here. We invite you to join us, whether you are an experienced yogi or new to yoga. We seek to teach safe, fun, and relational yoga every day to everybody. The practice of yoga tells us that the seed of everything we need for peace and wholeness is already inside us. But living and practicing yoga is best done in the context of a supportive community. Practice yoga, practicing yoga together, we will work to ignite the transformative and healing power of being fully present in our bodies and in our minds. Journey with us at Yoga Sanctuary as you connect with your inner self and share the expansive beauty of yoga with others for the benefit and blessing of all the world. So, I, I think that you know, the stretching aspect mm -hmm. is good. I, Exercise. This, this is one of the things that Peter Jones in Southern California, he makes a point that Hindus have lobbied the public school boards repetitively for yoga to be integrated mm -hmm. into the physical education of the public schools. And, if you, and with they give the rationale because this is how we recruit people yes. to our religion, is through the practice of yoga because it is our so I think John MacArthur, he said, you know, it could be stretching, but he also clarified if you're a strong Christian. Yeah. Um, because these things are very subtle. They're, they're very easy to to work in. And so and, and those who would Christianize and say, well, we're going to meditate on this. Um, I mean, I, I know a local church that offers a yoga class. You look in, they've got candles. Mm -hmm. They've got bricks with, like, the fruit of the spirit etched on them. They're acknowledging images. Yeah. They're acknowledging candles. Mm -hmm. They're acknowledging these things, and they're just trying to baptize them, so to speak, follow the essential oil. Meat sells at conferences. Meat, you know. Um, 
and and it works its way in, and then those of us in, in the reform circles, we either hyper like respond out of vitriol and hatred and all of this, or we feel the need to try to justify. And we'll see to walk wisely and carefully yeah. in how we in how we go about these things. Mark, you had a quick well, one. I was going to say, I I don't know anything about yoga. I have no desire to be yoga. So I'm trying Probably to best. this to something I know. And I was just wondering, could this be like karate or martial arts? There, um, Yeah, there's, there's some connection, too, in the karate and martial arts to the other, to okay. Eastern religions as well. If an official wants to do yeah. that, you, you have to look for a means to do that. It doesn't have for the right. stuff. Right. And I think that's okay. There's a lot of, you know, Goodness in martial arts, and I think you can remove the religious stuff. I, I just wonder if the same thing is true with yoga. I, could that be true? Emily. So that's sort of why I wanted to point out. So you can learn a lot of those things. I mean, it's actively doing those except for my kids are much bigger than some of them. And they're not worshiping anything. They're, they're people who really have to take care of their body. So what, what I hear, not to Specifically here, but just in Christian communities, when they're afraid of yoga, it's like you're just afraid to move your body at all because you might accidentally be worshiping a, a demon or something. So I think you just have to have that carefulness that you know God created our bodies in certain ways, and we have to care for them so that we don't damage them. Yeah, I mean, in yoga, try to avoid, don't, don't call it yoga, call it, I'm going to go out and exercise and stretch, you know, I'll listen to maybe sermons when I'm exercising or Christian music, but yoga demands a clearing of the mind, that's their meditation, it's 100% out of phase with our meditation, they want you to clear the mind so you can ab enable maybe other demons to come in. It opens up doors that is opposite of what Christianity teaches us. We're supposed to meditate on God's word, not clear our minds. And that's the, the danger area. I have more I wanted to show, and John MacArthur actually hits a home run with this next answer. Uh, again, I have not done yoga, but you do the postures, and there, um, one of the concerns is that it's an offering to some of the millions of Hindu gods. Is there a part of you in the spirits that's tweaked at all by this? Are you bothered at all? You practice yoga yourself. How do you, how do you go through it? Yeah, and I have to confess that I'm, I'm not very good at it. Yoga, it's really hard uh, to hold these postures, to hold these positions. And I'll tell you that from my own experience and the many, many people that I know who participate in yoga, none of them have ever found themselves to be opened up to something negative or something demonic or something evil. Um, in fact, many of us find the, the high benefit that comes from body-mind connection and from knowing that we are pushing, that we are stretching, that we are um, sending our body into, a, um, into an exercise. And that exercise is it's not wholly disconnected from our will or from right. our mind or from our spirit. It's a, it's a complete practice. And John, I've never known anybody who's had anything detrimental come John to their McCarthy, spirit because of their practice. Real quick, I want to get you in on this as well. Is all yoga bad yoga for the Christian? Well, let, let me just respond to what, what I've been hearing. Uh, that doesn't sound anything like Christianity. If you want a whole life, if you want your life to be what it should be, you don't put yourself in some weird physical position, empty your mind, center on yourself, and find a try to relieve your stress. You go to the Word of God, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You embrace in faith the sacrifice of Christ and his death and resurrection as your Savior and Redeemer. God comes, regenerates you, transforms your life, makes you a new creation, and you're saved, and you're on your way to heaven, and you can live a life of peace and joy. That's the promise of the gospel. That there is no contribution made to that by any physical position or any kind of uh, meditation. The idea of Christianity is to fill your mind with biblical truth and focus on the God who is above you. That's Christian worship. The idea of yoga is to fill your mind with nothing except to focus on yourself and try to find the God that is inside of you. From a Christian viewpoint, that's a false religion. Gentlemen, exercise is a different issue. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Have to leave it there. Okay, I have to love John MacArthur's clarity and boldness. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing I find very interesting about the subject is, especially from the, the cancer practice point of view, nothing is said about we need to be engaged in the sufferings of Christ. 
Good point. Yeah. And where do we get the idea that we can soft pedal that reality mm -hmm. by all this kind of feeling good stuff? That's not saying that we shouldn't be stewards of our body. Yeah, exactly. Right. Paul makes the point yep. of, of the using the athlete as mm -hmm. the example. That does it. That that does it's a separate. And I think the the, the other pastor just made the point. Exercise is one thing. Our faith in Christ is another thing. And and part of that is to re be ready to engage in the sufferings of Christ mm -hmm. now in the flesh. Yeah. And I just you know that it's so it sounds good because it's like you know I'm I'm hurting right now right yeah I would love right not to hurt. <laughs> But I also know that that's part of the sufferings of Christ. Yeah. Not, not to say, you know, I'm, all I'm saying is that we each have physical maladies that that are physical manifestations of, of our the fall, the, the, the mark of the fall, right? Because if, if the fall didn't occur, we would be okay. We're, we're going to be great in heaven, right? Uh, but there's nothing about the realities of, of the full Christian life, which includes the suffering yeah. of Christ. Good point. Mark? What concourse is Christ revealing? I think it's important when we look at these uh, philosophies which are embedded in all of these oriental um, physical concourse exercises. Every one of them has a religious, inextricably religious connotation to them. The body has this. Tai Chi has it. There you go. Knows somebody mm -hmm. who's fallen away from the faith of yep. you know, a very mature Christian, fell away from the faith. Gave, at his legacy, gave a huge donation to the furtherance of Tai Chi. Hmm. You can't do these things without having the effect of the origins of where they came from. In the Word of God, it says, all the exercise profit us a little. Right, little. Yep. You have to keep that in perspective. That's the same author that talks about being as an athlete, putting his body under constraint. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's one thing to have, you know, stretching exercises when you, you need to do something, but not to use what we know now or have known that this has been associated with Satanism. We're living in an era of syncretism where everything is spiritual. It all comes, it all leads us to God. And I think there's some uh, Christian discernment has been abandoned in our day. People aren't discerning Christian truth and how they do things or how they exercise. So, any other quick ones, and I'll move on. I have some. Some Christians. Some Christians. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I do that before I golf. I'll. Yeah. Right. So I would say I would say as a reformed Christian, we can't also we can't do these things as yoga, but we also can't like totally ignore it, right? We can't have ourselves be determined by yoga by not doing yoga. Yoga, I would say. Oh, okay, if you're exercising or stretching, call it exercising and stretching. Yeah. Don't call exactly. it yoga, because yoga is tied to Hinduism, and that's worshiping the Hindu gods with their poses. So just call it exercise and stretching and ignore yoga. That's, I don't know. Okay, I want to bring up some verses that defend the, the case. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So why are we, we shouldn't be emptying our minds. Romans 12.1, I urge you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is reasonable service of worship. So many people who practice yoga today are unaware that the Physical positions assumed in yoga symbolizes a spiritual act, and you're worshiping one of the many Hindu gods. To a Hindu, like we heard from that Swami, 
Yoga is the outward physical expression of a deep spiritual belief. He says you can't do yoga without worshiping poses. You can't separate the one from the other. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 to 22, But I say unto the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. This is a way to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of demons. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table in the table of demons. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Like that woman when she's doing her yoga exercise and, and had the elephant god in the background. The idol is nothing, but there is power behind the idol. There is dynamic, demonic force behind the idol that people are interacting with. Hebrews 1, 8, 9, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. We're going to end with how to reach Hindus. Some of us repetitive from last time with the a New Age movement because they're so similar. You know, reinforce, be loving and respectful. You know, there's Hindu people in our neighborhood, in our in our area. Hindus don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, always be ready to give offense to everyone who asks you for a reason of hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Ties into a little bit with what Pastor said today. And apologetics is more than just right answers. Avoid false assumptions. Don't assume all Hindus believe exactly the same things because they believe different gods. They may be united in certain core beliefs, but they also have certain distinct beliefs. Ask them questions and dialogue. They don't have a problem of evil. So you can say, well, how can everything be God? Was Hitler God? Was the Holocaust God? Here was a rabbi when he, he wrote The Death of a Guru, and he started thinking about his pantheistic beliefs in Hinduism. And he speaks of the ethical dissatisfaction he felt regarding a monistic, pantheistic worldview. He said, by growing awareness of God as the creator, separate and distinct from the universe that he made, contradicted the Hindu concept that God was everything, and that the creator and creation were one and the same. If there was only one reality, then God was evil as well as good, death as well as life, hatred as well as love. That made everything meaningless and life an absurdity. So he came to the conclusion it was not easy to maintain both one's sanity and the view that good and evil, love and hate, life, life and death are one reality. So ask strategic questions. You can't force your the theology on them, but well-placed questions force them to rethink their position. That's what Jesus did. He asked questions. You know, you can ask them, you know, you watch the evening news and you deny humans have a sin problem. Is everything we really see God? Is ISIS God, porn God, abortion God? Do you believe karma progressively rids humanity of its selfless desires? If we're getting better and better in humanity, how come there's been no improvement in human nature after thousands of years of reincarnation? And are you open to reality check? There, this is where you can bring in Hebrews 9.27. The Bible teaches that every human lives once. We don't have ultimate you know, reincarnations until we reach Brahman. He lives once, dies once, and then faces the judgment. And this is the verse, as it's appointed for men want to die once, but after this comes the judgment. So the benefit of questions, by asking such strategic questions, you can make your points from the Bible without forcing theology on them. You can also cause them to think for themselves. So before I close, any last questions on Hinduism? Yes, Edgar. I just wanted to share, um, the encounter I had with all these outside of our main gate, we have all these shops, and they're run by people from India. And these are, you know, all Hindus. And they worship their different gods. My friend and I were both Christians. We would go into those shops to share the gospel with them. Right. I remember one encounter where uh, they had their swami in the back and, and there's, you know, we're talking. He said, no, you should pray to him. I said, no, you should only pray to Christ. He said, no, he can be your Christ too. And, you know, we're sharing the gospel with them in this particular shop. They're getting mad. There's some Japanese nationals, and they're talking in their own language. We couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. They closed the shop, and they surrounded us. And they said, you need to stop talking about your one God in this street. You're, you, you've got to stop because you bother us too much. We're saying, well, you know, you can close the shop and intimidate us, but first, we're Marine. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to push us around. <laughs> Second, your God's going to do nothing to us. Yeah. But, um, you know, then I told him one time, I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we sit down over a cup of tea? You pick the day, you bring your Gita, 
Yeah. They read the Bible, they sit down, and they compare the scripture. And he agreed. They opened the shop, let us out. Who me at a such state? They came. I go in there. I asked uh, one of the guys, hey, where's so and so? Oh, he didn't want, he didn't, he's not here, he's gone. I said, why is he gone? We're not going to sit with you and talk. You would just end up confusing everybody. <laughs> we don't want you here. So uh, we try, um, yeah. but you know, they, they have their own their own mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they can become violent if they want to. They try to you kill know, those you know, This was a different country, it wasn't the United States. Okay. Yeah. You know, but it was in Japan and different <laughs> setting, but um, they they were really dead set uh, in protecting their theology and their God yeah. from being counted. In it's, yep, that's their worldview, and they're they're gonna stick to it. Then we'll go back. So, in the, in the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned some of the superficial connections between Hinduism and Christianity, for example, Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. So, when the Portuguese first arrived in India in the late 1400s, they believed that the Hindus were Christian. Oh. They heard them saying Krishna, Krishna. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. They, they did think that they were a very um, huge sect of Christianity. They pointed out all the paintings of the gods and said, wow, you knew the Virgin Mary with four arms and she flew it up to the The Virgin Mary with four arms. <laughs> And they're able to correct them. Yeah. Yes, Tony. I I, I believe it re- represents the chi or the third eye, and that's what they're trying to do is open up that third eye. And it's dangerous because you could be opening up yourselves up to demonic influences. Yeah, Pastor. You bring it closer to home with uh, Bitcoin and Charlie and some of the it's not a top building. Yes. In fact I I was and thinking about ta- showing a clip of that. Yeah. I think he has a six week course where he trains people how to be yogis and uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that. I can't answer that. All right, so a couple last slides. Give your testimony. You know, Hindus, just like New Age people, are experiential. So tell Hindus about your experience with Jesus, how he changed your life forever. Emphasize a relationship with a loving, personal God because they don't have a personal God. And use the holistic approach because they like to use that and use lots of scripture because the only way they'll become converted is they have to Hold God's word so the Holy Spirit can convert them. And that is it. Thanks.